Hello, friends. Bishop Jerry Hayes here. We're continuing the reading in the book entitled Letters to My Children on Apostolic Kingdom Theology. Uh, I trust that you have this book. If you don't, then I want to encourage you to go to Amazon Books and order it. Just order it by my name, Bishop Jerry Hayes, and uh, enter just the word letters, and this book will come up. And this uh, book is a compilation of 24 letters that I wrote to my children during the time when I was going through a conversion from the dispensational paradigm of eschatology to what is called realized millennialism. The traditional word is ah, millennialism. But I'm sure you would enjoy this read. And right after that we pray, we're going to be going to letter number 18, entitled All These Things. But before that we uh, go there and actually begin reading, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, you who sit upon the circle of the earth, we ask that you would illumine all in us that is darkness, anoint our minds, our hearts, and our lips, that we might understand, believe, and speak your word with clarity and conviction. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, in whom is the Father who made us, the Son who saved us, and the Holy Spirit that sanctifies us. Amen and amen. We're going now to letter 18. This letter is entitled, All These Things. I wrote this letter to my children on the subject of the signs recorded in the book of Matthew chapter 24, which Jesus said would signal the end of the Jewish age. Our scripture focus for this letter is Matthew chapter 24 and verse 24. Assuredly, I say unto you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Jesus of Nazareth, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. Dear children, as I write to you, it occurs to me that the seasons of the year are passing before us. I started this correspondence when the weather was hot. Now the days are cool and the nights cold, and it's not long before Christmas time, but I'm sure I'll miss all of you the most. However, it's comforting to me knowing that I am able to share these timeless truths with those whose very memory brings great joy to my soul. This 18th letter on kingdom theology will focus on the clause, all these things, from Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. Therefore, we will be revisiting letter 16. Now, Christ gave a number of predictions which he assured the disciples would transpire before the generation spoken of in Matthew 24, verse 34, had ended. In letter 16, I listed 10 of these predictions. Five of these are fairly generic and could, perhaps, be visible in all ages of history. But the last five listed have been set forth as evidence against a literal understanding of the term generation. It's argued that these five predictions were not fulfilled in the first century, and therefore the literal generation constituting of the contemporaries of Jesus was not intended. Of course, if our view of generation that we presented in letter 16 is correct, namely the multitude of people living contemporaneously with Christ, then it must be shown that all these things we're going to speak of here, especially the last five on the list, took place before A.D. 70, when God's judgment came upon Israel in such a complete fashion. A view of the list of the predictions in question will quickly reveal the challenge. Uh, 
from the list of 10 predictions, the following are the last five. Now, I will list them starting the number at six because of their order in the list of 10. Number six, the gospel of the kingdom preached in all the world, verse four. That's one of the signs Jesus said to look for. Seven, the appearing of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet in verse 15. Eight, the event of a great tribulation, verse 21. Nine, the darkening of the sun and moon, the stars falling from heaven. That's verse 29. And 10th, the appearing of the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. That's verse 38. Now the allegation is that the generation made up of the contemporaries of Christ did not produce these events. Excuse the expression, but I deny the allegation and challenge the alligator. Now, since it is the last five predictions in the list given in letter 16 that's in dispute, then that's where we'll focus. Each one of these predictions were prerequisites to the coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of glory, which Christ said would take place before his generation had passed. Therefore, the following five arguments will show that the 40 years between A.D. 30 and A.D. 70 did indeed see the fulfillment of, quote, all these things, end quote. Prerequisite then number six from our list of 10 is the gospel of the kingdom preached in all the world. Now notice that Jesus said this gospel, not some other that would come in some future messianic age. No, the gospel. He was now teaching. The one he preached and passed on to his disciples to teach all nations. The argument is that the disciples could not have possibly preached the gospel in all the world before A.D. 70. However, Paul disagrees. Writing to the Romans in A.D. 57, Paul states that the word of God had gone to the ends of the world. Romans chapter 10 and verse 18. To the Colossians, the same apostle states, quote, the gospel which was preached to every creature under heaven, end quote. Galatians 1.23 also should be seen. Now one might well ask, how could Paul make such claims? The answer is found in the Greek word used here for world. The Greek word is oikomene, Strong's New Testament number 3625 literally inhabited earth. Now this phrase is a New Testament era idiom that stands for the Roman Empire. The actual earth, the Greek G, pronounced actually gay, Strong's New Testament number 1093, is not intended by the word oikomene. To illustrate this truth, we need to see Luke chapter 2 and verse 1, where we're told that a, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus, quote, that all the world should be taxed, end quote. That's the King James Version. Obviously, not the entire literal world. Obviously. Only the part of the world under Roman rule was intended. The word oikomene is employed 10 times in the New Testament. Nine times it references the Roman Empire directly. And once, Hebrews 2 and 5, the kingdom of heaven is contrast to the earthly kingdom of Rome. Now this prerequisite for the coming of the end of the Jewish age, I might add, need to see letter 16, is an echo of the words of Jesus to his disciples in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 23, quote, 
for you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes, end quote. Prerequisite number seven. The appearing of the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Verse 15. Literally, the abomination that makes desolate. This is a reference to Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 through 27. Daniel tells us that, quote, The people of the prince shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. And on the wing of abominations shall be the one, it's all about the prince, the Antichrist, who makes desolate even until the consummation. And that determined is poured out on the desolate, end quote. Jesus, who is teaching this in AD 30, places the fulfillment of Daniel's abomination that makes desolate into his future albeit within his generation. See Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34. Certainly the Roman pagan Titus, AD 70, standing personally in the holy of holies of the great temple and thereafter raising the temple itself and replacing it with the temple of Jupiter would fit Daniel's predictions exactly. One might add, this has been the understanding of the Lord's church over the millennia. The recent neo-Orthodox view helped by premillennialists and the pre-tribulationist among them that the Jewish temple will be rebuilt in Jerusalem and animal sacrifices reinstated and then interrupted by a future Antichrist who demands to be worshipped as God is to be discounted out of hand in light of the kingdom teachings of Jesus. One need look no further than the Romans for Daniel's abomination that makes desolate. In fact, Luke records the parallel passage to this verse from Matthew. Luke gives the words of Jesus, quote, and when you see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh, end quote. Luke chapter 21 and verse 20, King James Version. Therefore, the abomination that makes desolate of Matthew chapter 23 and verse 15 is identified with the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans that concluded in AD 70 with the raising of the temple. Then there's prerequisite number eight, the great tribulation. Today, there is much teaching and preaching concerning the Great Tribulation. Many postulate a seven-year period beginning at the rapture and concluding with the physical arrival of Christ in Jerusalem and the beginning at that time of the thousand-year reign. Others are teaching that the world has already entered into the first part of the Tribulation and that the rapture will occur either halfway through or at the end. Most all futurists, you need to see letter two, see the great tribulation lasting seven years and identify it as the last week of the prophesied 70 weeks of Daniel in Daniel chapter nine, verses 20 through 27. Now, all this is interesting since the only mention in scripture of a great tribulation is in the Olivet Discourse given by Jesus in Matthew chapters 24 and 25. Here Jesus explicitly places this great tribulation within his generation. We covered this in letter 16. There are some particular characteristics of this tribulation that must be acknowledged. First, Daniel seems to speak of this great tribulation when he writes, quote, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that time, end quote. Daniel chapter 12 and verse one. Secondly, Daniel assigns this trouble to the Jewish people. 
3rd, Jeremiah agrees by identifying the same period as Jacob's trouble. Now, Jacob is Israel. See Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7. And fourthly, Jesus assigns this period of tribulation to his generation and names it, quote, the great tribulation, end quote. So three things are observed concerning the great tribulation. One, it is a time of trouble like none other that ever was or ever will be. Two, it comes upon the Jews, the children of Jacob. Thus, it is called Jacob's trouble. Three, it would occur during the lifetime of the multitude of people living as contemporaries with Jesus and the apostles. Now, some have objected to this third observation by supposing that the destruction visited upon the Jews in the Jewish-Roman War did not have as horrible as a trouble inflicted on the Jews as was inflicted upon the Jews by Hitler and Stalin in the 20th century. Now, those who make such claims could not possibly be familiar with the history of Flavius Josephus on the Jewish-Roman War of the first century. By the end of the second revolt, A.D. 130, no son of Jacob was left in all the Holy Land. All had been either killed, sold into slavery, or deported to other parts of the Roman Empire. No Jew was allowed in all of Judea on pain of death. Hundreds of years later, when a Jewish holy man moved to Jerusalem to live and several families were imported from Syria to provide the required number of 10 males called a minion so prayers could be made. There was not 10 Jewish males in all the city that was estimated to house 3 million people during the time of the Roman siege in A.D. 70. Friend, neither Hitler nor Stalin brought such complete desolation to the land of Judaism and its people. Then there's prerequisite number nine, signs in the heavens. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. Quote, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken, End quote. Perhaps it is this particular prophecy that has been the greatest stumbling block to the futurist in applying a literal interpretation to Jesus' use of the word generation in verse 34 of Matthew chapter 24. The argument asserts that since this astral event or these astral events have not yet occurred, Jesus could not have meant his generation, the multitude alive in his day, with the generation clause of verse 34 of Matthew chapter 24. Here again, doctrinal error is infused into the Lord's church by well-meaning teachers, so-called, who lack a biblical, in biblical scholarship. When applying the E2 paradigm that we talked about in letter 10, for interpreting this passage, one should be acutely aware of the importance of two particular laws of scriptural interpretation. First is the law of context. When Jesus mentions the sun being darkened, the moon not giving light, and the stars of heaven falling, he spoke prophetically in the context of judgment. We therefore must view this passage in the context of other like passages from the Holy Bible. Second, in the law is the law first mentioned. 
The law first mentioned simply stated is this. Any biblical article should be identified with the meaning made clear when that article was first mentioned in Scripture. In that the entire Bible has but one author, namely the Holy Spirit. What the Spirit intended by his use of the term or phrase at the beginning most likely carries throughout. Now, by applying these two laws, namely context and first mention, well, we're brought to Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10. Quote, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. End quote. Here the subject and the language are the same as in our text, Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. The subject is judgment. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29, the judgment is pronounced upon Jerusalem. Paul in Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10, the judgment is pronounced upon Babylon. One should read the whole chapter of Matthew chapter 13. In both cases, the sun is said to be darkened the moon will not shine, and the stars shall fail. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29 says the stars fall, while Isaiah 13 and 10 say they shall not give their light. The intention in both passages is the same. What did the Holy Spirit mean by these cosmic references in Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 10? When Babylon was judged, did the sun, moon, and stars literally stop shining? Obviously not. Now, this was prophetic symbolism in Isaiah 13 and 10, symbolizing a turning of an age with the overthrowing of world powers and governments. Therefore, the same language was used in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 29. In the same context of judgment on earthly power, namely Judaism. Now, this must be understood in the same way as the parallel passage of Isaiah chapter 13 and 10. Thus, the language is prophetic poetry set in symbolic representations to illustrate the overthrow of earthly powers which had come into judgment before Almighty God. Lastly, there's prerequisite number 10, the sign of the Son of Man. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 30 reads, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory, end quote. Now, Jesus informs us that just before his coming in judgment, the sign of the Son of Man would appear in heaven. Again, the future is point to this sign and say, it has not yet happened. Therefore, the generation clause of verse 34 could not have been indicating the contemporaries of Jesus. Well, not so fast. Two interpretations of heaven have been suggested for the word uranos. Strong's Greek number 3772. One is the sky and two, the abode of God. The word is used for both the sky and the abode or throne of God. If the letter is intended, namely the abode of God, then Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 would be the interpretation where a, quote, son of man, end quote, represents the kingdom of God. This, quote, son of man, end quote, symbol is seen receiving the kingdom from the Ancient of Days, in which case the sign is visible in the heaven or the abode of God. 
If the former interpretation, namely the sky, is intended, then the sign would appear in the sky and be visible for people on earth to see. If this is the sense, then the sign of the Son of Man would most likely be the star which led the Magi to Jesus at Bethlehem. This comet, comet, this comet-like, cosmic light, <laughs> try that real fast, this comet-like cosmic light appeared again over Jerusalem just before God's judgment was visited upon the Jews. One needs to see Josephus, Wars 6.5.3. In truth, neither of the above views cancels out the other. As this sign appeared in the sky, heaven of the earth, there is a profound indication of a sign also appearing in the heaven, the abode of God, at the same time. In line with this reasoning, the following is offered. Notice that heaven is juxtaposed with earth in the verse, namely, the sign in heaven is paralleled with the tribes on earth. What is more important? This is a reference to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, where Daniel saw the sign of God's kingdom as that of a man, whereas the kingdoms of the world were portrayed as beasts in verses 3 through 8. The sign was in heaven at the throne of the Ancient of Days. The man symbol stood for the saints of the Most High. See Daniel chapter 7 and verse 18. What Daniel saw prophetically, namely the sign of the Son of Man, Jesus speaks of here. It is manifested in the heaven, sky of the earth, as the comet star, which Josephus reported seeing over the city of Jerusalem for a whole year before its judgment. Now, I am concluding here, I am including here the quote from Josephus for your consideration. This is the wars of the Jews or the history of the destruction of Jerusalem. Flavius Josephus, translated by William Winston, Wars of the Jews, 6.5.3, quoting Josephus. Thus were the miserable people persuaded by these deceivers and such as belie God himself, while they did not attend nor give credit to the signs that were so evident and did so plainly foretell their future desolation. But like men infatuated without either eyes to see or minds to consider, did not regard the denunciation that God made to them. Thus, there was a star resembling a sword which stood over the city and the Greek chi, which can also be interpreted even, a comet that continued a whole year. End quote. Flavius Josephus. Here's our conclusion. From the above information, clearly, all the signs, including the five just reviewed, which Jesus said would be manifested before the end of his generation, did, in point of fact, occur during the 40 years window between A.D. 30 and A.D. 70. Therefore, the generation clause of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 34 does not need to be explained away. Jesus may be believed. His prophecies are yea and amen. Grace to you, dear children. From Christ our Lord, I am your loving Father. 
And here we're going to conclude this episode. Be sure to catch our next episode where we're talking about letter number 19. And in that letter, we're going to be dating, not the coming of the Lord, no man can do that, but we're going to be dating the writing of the book of Revelation. The Lord bless you until we're together again. I am Bishop Jerry Hayes, and it is my prayer, beloved, that you go with God and that he goes with you, and that the Lord sanctify you wholly in your mind, in your body, and also in your spirit. Amen and amen.